Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. We have um, almost 90 people here with us right now, so I'm very excited. Um, my name is Lisa Brundage, and I am the Director of Teaching, Learning, and Technology at Macaulay. Um, and I am so delighted to have you here for a very special evening um, with artist, poet, and novelist Carmen Bellosa. Um, before I introduce her, I am going to give you just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I want to let everybody know that we're going to hear a presentation and and then we'll have a chance for some Q&A. Um, you'll see a Q&A button on your toolbar and you can put questions in there as they occur to you throughout the talk, but we'll take questions at the end. Um, if you ask an anonymous question, I will read it out. Um, but if you put your name on it after the talk is done, we will invite you to um, unmute your microphone and ask your question directly. So if you feel like that's something that would be um, fun for you, please don't be shy. Um, I also want to let you know that we, we are recording this evening. So you can take that into account too when you're choosing whether to be anonymous or have your name displayed on your questions. Um, and um, I think that with that, I am going to introduce Carmen Biosa to you. Carmen Biosa is a poet, novelist, playwriter, essayist, and artist. Um, she has held fellowships with the Coleman Center, the Guggenheim, the DAAD, and has been a Fonca Fellow. She was born in Mexico City in 1954, and she lives in Coyoacan, Mexico, and in Brooklyn, New York. Um, she has received the Casa de América de Poesia Americana Prize from Madrid, the Rosalia de Castro Prize. Uh, she was awarded by Galatia's Pen um, and the Anna Seegers Prize from the Arts Academy of Berlin. Um, she also has won the um, Literature Prize for the German version of her novel La Migrosa um, and the um, uh, Javier Villatura Prize um, for the novel Antes, meaning before, um, translated by Peter Bush and published by Deep Vellum. Um, she also has the poetry collection La Sabaja and Papeles Irresponsible, um, published in Mexico, and the Café Giron de Novela Prize for El Complot de los Fomenticos. And I want to say I'm not a Spanish speaker, so I know I'm not doing that well at this, but so please be patient with me, and I apologize. Um, and she has also had um, five New York Emmys for the show Nueva York that she does with CUNY TV, among many other honors. Um, she ran a theater bar in Coyoacan. Um, she prints her own art books, directed some of her own plays, and she served as chief advisor to a major museum exhibition, Nueva York, 1613 to 1945. Um, she's engaged in the writing and production of a feature film, Los Padres Ablan. An exhibit um, of some of her art was held at the Museo Carrillo Gil in Mexico City. Um, and we also did an exhibition of her work at Macaulay Honors College. Um, so uh, she also um, has had artworks displayed at the Seminaria de Cultura Mexicana um, and has the Alchemy of Planets, an artist book uh, printed by the Old School Press with images created by Philip Hughes and Amy Petra Woodward, um, along with her poems written in Spanish by the Mexican poet herself, Carmen Bellosa, um, and translated into English by Psyche Hughes. Um, Carmen Biosa has been a visiting professor at NYU, Columbia, CCNY of CUNY, Georgetown, um, and many others, including us at Macaulay Honors College. Um, she received the Anna Seegers Prize, um, the Liberture Press, uh, the Premio de Novella Café in Huron, Rosalie de Castro, and the New York Public Library recently acquired her papers and artist book. Um, she has more than a dozen books and over 90 dissertations have studied her work. And I could not be more delighted to turn this over to her now for her talk, Latinx on the Town, Spanish-speaking artists and writers encountering New York City, 1900 to 1957. Carmen, thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for being with us this uh, night. Uh, we, I am going to introduce to you some artists. I guess you already know a good number of them, artists and writers. And uh, to do that, I'm going to share with you a screen. Let's start there. I chose this title or post title for our conversation today. The universe is made of stories, not of atoms. 
Some New York artists, artistas, writers, escritoras from 1900 to 1950-ish, more or less. Uh, and I chose this quote because it's uh, Muriel was the first translator of the Nobel Prize winner, the Mexican Nobel Prize winner, Octavio Paz. But also because I thought, I wanted, I had the dream of sharing with you a whole narrative. I have tried that several times, but it is practically impossible to really incorporate all the writers that have written in Spanish in New York uh, and the artists um, from the Latin, the Latin uh, Latino artists uh, in those very rich decades. Um, I, in this occasion, I did try and I hope any of you when you decide to do your dissertation, any of you or several ones of you decide to take, stay, take side by side a history book an essay that really tells the story of the of the, how did the, how does the relationship between the Spanish speaking and Latino Ibero American artists and writers have related with New York? Okay, I'm going to start today with one piece, one art piece that. Um, was not created in New York, was not created in New York, but was painted by Diego Rivera, the Mexican artist that you can now go and see in the Vida Americana exhibition at the Whitney Museum in another facet, another side of his artistic uh, personality, complex, and a very rich personality. We are here in a painting called La Mujer en el Pozo, the woman at the well, um, he, that he painted in Paris in 1912, when he arrived and he felt the vibrant uh, cosmopolitan world artists that came from all around the world and that were there with one goal. They wanted to reinvent art. They wanted to start art all over. They wanted to forget what art had been thought to be and they wanted to do it all new. So he did this, uh, it's a cubist, a little bit futurist, it's an edge painting uh, where he wants us to feel the movement and he wants us to feel that the artist does not rule completely the situation. He's kind of analyzing the image, he is in a way cutting it into pieces to make it for us more rich and to ex explore the immense possibilities of forms, arts, art forms, colors and perception, perception we are going to have. He is in many ways tuning with uh, not only with the art world, because artists not only have a dialogue with artists themselves, but he's tuning with what's happening around the world. So he painted this. You can see here that where, where's the well? The well is there. Where's the water? Well, the water is there, but it's kind of solid. We can say instead that air is liquid or not. There's nothing really solid, really liquid. Her body is a bit here and a bit there, is part of reality. That's our perception of reality. That's how we perceive what is around us. And excuse my English, every day is worse. I don't know what's going on with me. I went to a school with American nuns. Um, I learned English since I was a little girl and my accent has decided to go home every day more. 
I think language is home for all of us. And language, yes, it is home. It means the place where we were born, but also is the way where we make home with others. So here is uh, the Paris he arrived to. Um, the Cubans dominate Paris Fall Salon. We have the cover of the New York Times, and we have some artists that are featured in the cover, Metzinger, Deren, Matisse, Fries, Herbin, Brack. They forgot women. It happens so frequently. So I added here five extraordinary futurist pioneers, Russian women, because I thought that Diego Rivera had to know who they were. He was the lover of a Cuban artist, eh, Angelina Angelina Belov, who he painted in this also 1912-1913 art piece. And in the right side, we are seeing one painting of hers, of Angelina Belov. Okay, we'll return a second to the painting to know that when he had finished this piece, he received a visit from a Mexican friend. And the Mexican friend told him news what was going on in Mexico those days. There was a civil war. There was a revolution. The people had gone out to with weapons. The whole country was in fire. That Diego Rivera knew partially that was also partially a reason why he was in Paris, not that he was an exile, not that he was escaping, uh, but he had had his um, little problems in the state as we are going to with the state as we are or non-state the lack of state as we're going to see with many other artists and writers that we're going to visit today here so he explained him how we were fighting against where in which parts of this of the country uh, the army also was in factions who was here who was there who had divided pancho villa was his favorite uh, of the voice that is telling him this story, but there is another very interesting uh, character, very interesting protagonist, and at the same time, disturbing pro uh, uh, character, protagonist for, for who is telling the story. I will introduce you to him. He's telling the story to Diego Rivera of what's going on in Mexico in when they are both of them in Paris and that other character Zapata. Zapata who was the hero of a big part of the population in Mexico and whom together with Villa had already taken the capital of Mexico, had just entered Mexico City. We are already in 1914. Please take a, a look at this photograph. You are going to see there all colors, all social classes of Mexico joining Zapata and Villa, the two revolutionaries of Mexico. And we are going to have also all ages but we are going to see only one woman. It used to be always told these photographs, identifying them all except this lady. Well, this lady, Dolores Jimenez y Muro, was the ghost writer of Zapata. He created, coined for him voices, coined for him also uh, slogans, and one of them was, La tierra es de quien la trabaja. The land belongs to whoever works it, was in fact the logo, the motto of the movement of Zapata. When Diego Rivera heard this story, he turned around the painting he had been, he had done, he had been working on. In fact, he covered it with a purple coat of painting and he went into another a side of his career or another, let's say, form. But we cannot speak of forms as if they were something different for an artist. He wanted to say something different. And what he wanted to say, he labeled it as 
first he called it um, the guerrillero. It was in fact the second name, but the first name meant el trofeo de Zapata, which meant that he was about to lose, Zapata was about to lose, and these were his parts and his remainings that people were going to show of him, as happened with the trofeos in the Roman Empire. But uh, um, he then rethought his painting and he ended calling it Zapata's landscape, the landscape of Zapata. He started looking at his own art differently. What do we see there? In fact, we do see, we can recognize kind of a human form, but it is totally deconstructed. But all the parts of him, of Zapata, still remain in its place. We have, instead of the head, a kind of eye. We do have the hat. We have the sarape, the characteristic cover that is going to be identified with the Mexicanity. And we are seeing on it a, a very rough landscape, in fact. But we are seeing there the gone of Zapata. And we can see him there, as we saw it in the photograph, standing up in this characteristic posture. The trees are upside down, the world is upside down, everything is changing. Okay, we have kind of seen what he's painting. This is the voice that told him the news. He is a Mexican writer, Martin Luis Guzman, an important Mexican writer who, be, who was also a diplomat, who was also an editor, who was going to be an important intellectual in Mexico during several decades till he died in 1974. Martin Luis Guzman was painted himself by Diego Rivera. We have him painted with, also we see there, the Sarape, uh, and we see him as he was represented by Diego Rivera. Martin Luis Guzman himself, who was a novelist of the Mexican Revolution, who is going to tell us the story of the Mexican Revolution in his novels, plus many other works. Martin Luis Guzman, who lived in New York for almost a decade, and in New York, edited his own magazine, a magazine in Spanish, where he published writers that lived in the United States and wrote in Spanish, and then uh, distributed his magazine all over America. Um, and he, he, he's here, he's going to tell the story of the revolution, he's going to have his own point of view as every one of the artists of the Mexican revolution or post-revolution were going to have their own point of view about the revolution. I still see myself. Sorry, it's okay? Do we have a problem, Joe? No? Okay. So we have here two, I brought you the covers of two of the books of um, Martin Luis Guzman. Oh, luckily, I could not find a cover, and I don't have the book here with me. I have it in Mexico, I'm in Brooklyn. A book he wrote that is called On the, on the Side of the Hot Sun, A Orillas del Hot Sun, on the, on the, yes, on the border of the Hot Sun, on the Hot Sun River's border. Uh, where he tells his, how was his story. But let us return to Diego Rivera, the young Diego Rivera uh, in, in Paris and see what happened with his piece that he had just painted. How was it received? It was badly received. In that cosmopolitan world, nationalism was not something people liked. They wanted to create, the artists were into creating a common land for everybody. They didn't want national identities. They wanted a common country for everybody. The critics didn't like it. Pierre Reverdy, who was like the, one of the most uh, influential critics, thought that Rivera's painting was horrible. We see here another pieces of the, the artists that were part of his circle. Um, and 
he was he went, he had gone into another this is a former painting of Diego Rivera before he paints Zapata but already like a station here we have Picasso and his Mademoiselle d'Avignon and what else happened with the painting of Diego Rivera well he received the visit of uh, Picasso. Picasso loved to visit Pablo Picasso, loved to visit the, the workshops of the other artists. And he went to visit, in the absence of Diego Rivera, the workshop of the Rivera, and he saw the painting and Rivera got furious because the next thing he saw was, according to Rivera, that Picasso had stolen from him his painting, his idea. And he went against Picasso, bad idea. And he went and wrote and said, Picasso has copied all of us. And Picasso responded, the good artists copy, but the great artists steal. So he didn't apologize, he, uh, he didn't care about that accusation uh, and Diego Rivera retired from the Parisian circle not appreciated by his ex-colleagues. Let's move, let's do ourselves a little move and go to our city, the city we are going to talk about today that is in fact linked to so, other, so many other cities because a great city has in fact not to copy, not to steal from the other cities, but has to nourish itself also as the other great cities do with it. They, the big cities communicate between them. So let's do this little rush as that car rush that happened in 1908 happened and let's arrive to our city, Nueva York. I wanted to land here because the first piece I want us to look at is from Joaquin Sorolla, the Spanish artist that had exhibited this piece of his, as you might be able to read aside, since 1908. Sorry, 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 I'm rushing, I'm rushing. In a, in, it was inside a church. Well, it was like being in a public exhibition, this piece of compassion this piece of a Spanish artist that was not as the artists we have just visited, but in which we can in fact breathe the beginning of the 20th century. We are seeing there's something somewhat like impressionist, like it is not a classical painting, it's not a painting of the 19th century. Okay. Um, so we are in New York and we're to say, well, where our, our, our theme is what's going on with the artists and the writers, the Latino artists and writers in New York City. We have here um, the Hispanic Society of America that was founded in 1904 by Archer M. Huntington. The institution remains at its original location in Audubon Terrace at 155th Street and Broadway. It houses an extraordinary collection. It's been in renovation during the last, I guess, eight years, a lot of years, it's been in renovation, but it will one day or other open and one can visit it with a pointy. We see, of course, pieces of Sorolla who brought us here, whom we are seeing there, the bulls, but it also houses a lot of classical art, has Velázquez, has Goyas, has El Greco, has an immense collection of prints and photographs of documents, of uh, documents and books that explain the custom, the peoples, the architecture of the Spanish and the Latin America. It, it houses, let's say it's a house that works, that houses art, history and literature. Um, he carved the building 
you you have to go visit it as soon as it again opens and if you are interested in a specific piece that is not in the second traveling go and see what conchington see the Dina city that if you go back in history new york was not founded as a friend friendly city to the spanish or latin american it was not a latino La latinox friendly at all uh, here we have mr huntington and let's go now to something totally different uh, he was a donor so of course they were those that were after his donations that were was going to help artists and writers as it happened to one of the greatest spanish-speaking writers of the 20th century ruben darío such a great writer it is said that with him the spanish language returned the caravels to spain and conquered with its new literature spain this modernist writer in reality did what artists in generations want to do he recreated the spanish language so he's there ruben darío he visited in fact three times new york uh, the last time he came 1914 is when he dedicates that book but he had been here passing by from Buenos Aires, going to Madrid. They had to stop in New York. He was not the only one, the only one. They passed by. New York was a port of entry. They passed and they stayed. And we see here him aside, Jose Martí, that is not today in our time period, but that lived long in New York, a total period of 31 years for very different reasons that just trying to receive or find some funding for his personal expenses. But he was thinking of the independence of Cuba, the independence from the um, Spanish dominion, from the Spanish empire. Um, Rubén Darío wrote, Rubén Darío thought as had as several generations before of Latin American and Spanish artists had thought that the magnet was the magnet for artists was in Paris. So he had lived in Paris, he had written about Paris, he had loved Paris and he had a complex relationship with New York as we can hear uh, read, I'm going to read in Spanish and you can follow the English translation. Casas de 50 pisos, servidumbre de color, millones de circuncisos, máquinas, diarios, avisos y dolor, dolor, dolor. Estos son los hombres fuertes que vierten áureas corrientes y multiplican simientes por su ciclopio fragor y tras la quinta avenida La miseria está vestida con dolor, dolor, dolor. Sé que hay placer y que hay gloria allí, en el Waldorf Astoria, en donde dan su victoria la riqueza y el amor, pero en la orilla del río sé quienes mueren de frío. Y lo que es triste, Dios mío, de dolor, dolor, dolor. Porque aunque dan millonarios sus talentos y denarios, Son muchos más los calvarios donde hay que llevar la flor de la caridad divina que hace el pobre y a Dios inclina y da amor, amor y amor. So, he was not precisely happy with New York. He had this relationship not precisely of admiration and he hadn't let his poetry be permeated by the city in a really like we are going to see it happened in visual artists and as had happened to the poetry of Jose Martí, the Cuban independentist and extraordinary writer, first class poet that introduced to the Spanish speaking world the richness of the Anglo-American poetry. 
even though his Spanish was perfect and he always spoke only in a Spanish from his Cuban homeland, he let it grow looking at the tradition of the poets that he also sometimes translated and enriched our tradition with them too. Okay, so as I was telling you, not everybody came after the money of Mr. Huntington, nor after the help for their uh, country's independence, uh, artists came for very different reasons. Here we have Luisa Capetillo, this woman writer from Arecibo, Puerto Rico, activist and writer that came to New York because she was in the feminist fight. She was a playwright. She had formerly worked at a tabaqueria, a tobacco uh, workshop, and she became a very, uh, sorry about the lapsus there, playwright author about the typo I committed. And let's see a quote of her, oh, you woman who is capable and willing to spread the seed of justice, do not hesitate, do not fret, do not run away, go forward. And we see her first woman, of Puerto Rico, it is said that wore pants, as you can see her attire. Alirio Guerra is not Puerto Rico. Oh gosh, I think I was sleeping when I wrote these two little titles. I wrote the titles at the very end because I thought it was better to have them there and not me go and show my face and go back to them, but just go from one to the other one. No, 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 not Puerto Rico, sorry, sorry. Colombia. He wrote what is called, according to Nico Nascanelos, the first immigration, Latino immigration of the United States. It was published here in New York in 1912. Here we are now with an artist. Let me close here all of it because then we are with an Uruguayan artist who lived in New York City from 1920 to 1922. As did Rubén Darío in his poetry, though he didn't go into this dialogue with the Anglo poetry, he did make vibrate a bit the sound and he named the misery of seeing the poverty in such a rich city misery that New York has not overcome, as you all know. It is just so uh, disgusting to see that in New York the disparity of social classes is so enormous. That was captured by uh, Rubén Darío and Joaquín Torres García from Uruguay. Others call him García Torres because uh, the Latin American custom is to go first the mother, the father last name and then the mother, so they switch the one, one last name into the other one, uh, and who lived in New York City and who was an extraordinary influential artist wherever he lived. He had lived in Barcelona, he had been in the Art Deco movement, he had been influential bringing something new into the Art Deco, he had then lived in Paris, he then lived in New York, and in New York he captured the feeling, the movement in his paintings, the movement of the city. He, here he tried to do uh, an adventure of producing certain kind of toys that were for adults and for children, and it didn't work, so he left New York, but he passed by in other occasions. Okay, uh, why don't we move up? Here we have another one, another Torres Garcia painting of his. Uh, Juan Ramón Jiménez. Juan Ramón Jiménez, who won the Nobel Prize in 1956, and who died in Puerto Rico, a Spanish poet, uh, who wrote, uh, he came to New York just for personal reasons, he came to uh, the family of his to be wife didn't want her to marry him because he was a poet and a poet they thought it was not a good candidate for their daughter so they brought her to New York to put some ocean between him and the poet that was after her bones as my father would say and um, 
Juan Ramón Jiménez came after her and married her, seduced her again, and he loved her, and they were companions through all their lives. And he wrote this book, and he also wrote a, a very good pages on New York. He was a uh, New York made on him an impact, uh, and also in a way on his poetry. His poetry wasn't so much read in New York. That was kind of uneven um, correspondence, as was not the case of Joaquin Garcia Torres, the Uruguayan artist that we passed by, that in fact made very good friends, and uh, nor the case of Luisa Capetillo that did uh, nourish and nourish the, the feminists that were around, but um, it wasn't the case of him. Here we have in the left side the Mexican writer and politician uh, and public intellectual Jose Vasconcelos, that if you go to see the Whitney exhibition on on Vida Americana, how the Mexican muralist, muralists influenced and left uh, a, a, an imprint in the three biggest Mexican muralists were so influential for the American artists. Uh, Jose Vasconcelos, um, who came to New York in 1915 because he had backed one of the generals of the revolution and when he was murdered by another one uh, who then took over power, he better escape to New York. When he was here, he decided to join another general, Alfredo Obregón, who became the president of Mexico, gave him the secretary of education, and he is the patron from the state of the Mexican muralists. He is going to be a factor for a Mexican muralism. Uh, before that, he had been chancellor of the university, also under Álvaro Obregón. He is the one that will invite Siqueiros, Diego Rivera, Orozco, Montenegro, and Charlotte, and other artists, to paint the walls of the buildings in Mexico. Uh, here we see him. Um, when he's young, it's not a photograph taken in New York City, but could have been because it's exactly his time. And on our right side, we have Pedro Enriquez Ureña. In the left side, we have Jose Vasconcelos with himself, I'm sorry, but in the right side, I put Pedro Enriquez Ureña with an extraordinary Dominican poet who happened to be his mother too, Salome. Salomé Ureña, great poet. Uh, Pedro Enrique Ureña did live those years in New York. They didn't return to New York in the 40s when they both again go in exile uh, because for reasons I do not understand, Jose Vasconcelos said, if we move to New York now, if we go to New York, it's going to be our intellectual death. And I really don't understand his decision because many others that will happen and see here did not find in New York their intellectual death, but a city where they could work, they could grow, and they could also nourish the cultural and intellectual and artistic life of the city. One of them is the Mexican Veracruz and from Veracruz artist and writer that arrived at New York City as, as in 1907. He was a, a young person. He had been born in 1818. His father owned two newspapers in Mexico, and he did something that was not liked by the Mexican general that had ruled the country for three decades, Porfirio Diaz. So, they had to go to exile, they were threatened by him, and they had to leave, and uh, Marius came to live to New York City, where he's going to do an important career as an artist, as a writer, as a gallery owner, and as an art promoter. Here we have his cartoons, one of them, one cartoon of Marius de Sayas, another one, Marius de Sayas, 
another one that, and here we have wait a second before we go there and maybe I'm going to appear for a second and stop share for a minute just to know you are still alive though I always it's so strange the story of Zoom because I don't see you I don't see you it's something so st where are you I know you are there so let's count on you you are there we are you are following and here we have then our Marius de Sayas in 1909 he had already published lots of cartoons in Mexican newspapers and he was already publishing cartoons in a New Yorker newspaper and um, Stiglitz who is himself was himself a photographer and who owned an important gallery um, invited him to exhibit his cartoons so in 19 09, he exhibits in, he, in, in the Stiglitz gallery his uh, caricatures, his, the cartoons he's, he's done, his caricatures. Um, but he repeat, it was a success exhibition. And he repeated the exhibition again. And what he did is instead of having the cartoons in the walls, he made them in three dimensions and he placed them over the Fifth Avenue. And there were a hundred pieces and there you had a hundred important New Yorkers that were kind of uh, walking to say so. Yes, they were stable, but they were all in the gesture of moving along the Fifth Avenue in front of the Plaza Hotel. And it was a hit. Uh, Stiglitz wanted to work more with the Sayas. Sayas also wanted to work more with him and in 90, started working together in the gallery, inventing new exhibitions with our other artists. And in 1910, the Sayas goes to Paris, scouting for artists for Stiglitz for New York City. Uh, Marius de Sayas makes the first interview the first major interview to Pablo Picasso he makes the first interview to Picasso and also brings Picasso to exhibit to New York City when he is in New York in he stays a whole year 1910 till 1911 he discovers African art he brings the African art the African traditional art and proposes to Stiglitz an exhibition which is done also, and also all New York discovers the avant-garde of Paris, Picasso, Brack, the artists that had been in that circle of Diego Rivera, also Diego Rivera is brought to New York, are brought here by Marius de Sayas, this Mexican artist, gallerist, son of this important journalist, it was a very wealthy family, and he also married money, may I say, uh, but that is another story. In 1914, he returns to Paris, and he then meets Picabia, and with him meets Apollinaire, Gertrude Stein, uh, George Bernard Shaw, widens the circle. By then, he is already publishing, I'm going to show you, his publishing with uh, um, with the gallery. Let's start, start continue from there. With um, with the gallery of Stiglitz, he's publishing a magazine called, like the gallery, two hundred ninety one, in which he publishes it. In which they invite writers and artists. Here, what we see is the art of the the same Marius de Sayas. There we have Marius de Sayas with one of his, yes, that is a caricature, but it's also, you see how he gets into doing his caricature, but he's also doing in it an art. There we have another piece of Marius de Sayas in the L from the journal to the piece L from this journal to 91. We are in 1915. Two paintings of the Sayas, 
And now we're going to go to another Mexican. But before that, I do have to tell you that after he returns from Paris, the second time he's there, and he brings more artists, he opens his own gallery, an own gallery that he calls the Modern Art Gallery, opens with Picasso exhibition, Brancusi exhibition, Diego Rivera exhibition, Cezanne exhibition, and uh, it kind of, uh, our, his relationship with Stiglitz kind of freezes, but we can do say that behind the Museum of Modern Art, we can trace these figures, Stiglitz and Marius de Sayas, the Mexican artist that came and became a New Yorker, made the city more rich in, in its art scene and reach the city. He uh, was asked to, in years later, he left the city, went to Paris when he was already again uh, married, traveled thoroughly through Europe, continued writing, continued doing his art, and in, uh, later on the director of the Museum of Modern Art is asking him to, asks him, to write his view of modern art. By then, he had already published books about modern art uh, with all these traveling and organizing exhibitions, but he wants him to publish something that makes it more comprehensible. He had done the first book about the modern art of those decades, and he wanted to do, let's say, the real final art that would capture what those decades had made in the visual arts. Uh, but uh, he died and it was published, in fact, um, posthumously. He never returned at the end to live to New York City. He went to live to Connecticut and other places. Well, here we have another Mexico Mexican that arrives to New York City for different reasons. He comes also with the turmoil of the Mexican, now we call it the Mexican Revolution, when his favorite falls into out of power. He takes a bad bet in reality, a bet that um, is not precisely fantastic. That's why they say, or he himself wrote, that when he left to New York, he was not only fleeing from Mexico, but he was trying to flee from himself. Um, Jose Juan Tablada, who is a writer, as I said, uh, and who wrote about many other artists and writers, Mexicans and Latin American than Spanish that passed by in New York, founded also, well, he was a, a founded Libreria de los Latinos, an important bookstore in Madison Avenue that uh, sold foreign books. He brought, as the Sayas had done with the visual arts, Jose Juan Tablada did it with literature. He had lived in Japan as a diplomat years before. He had lived in Paris. He had lived in Italy. He had traveled around the world. He knew what was being published. He was a polyglot. He spoke several languages and he brought the books in Spanish and also worked with people trying to convince them with the editors, trying to convince them to um, translate them and publish them. Influenced by the Japanese um, poetry, he started creating calligrams. Uh, this one is called Talon Rouge. The words give the form of the poem. Possibly to our eyes today, this is not a surprising, this is the knife, this is not a surprising for somebody in 2020, but it was really very surprising for his readers or for the readers when he started publishing this uh, calligramas uh, in the late tens of the former century and in the early 20s and through the 30s. This is the moon, the bird, the bird that sings musical, etc., like a little flute. Um, we see the moulin, the palm. Um, this is if we want to share this, then you can click on his timeline. He writes about Miguel Covarrubias, another 
Mexican artist that arrives to New York City in 1924 and that discovers Harlem. Now his representation of the Afro-Americans is a little bit irritant and can be even called racist. But it was not the case when he started publishing them in 1924. He was very close friend of Langston Hughes. He illustrated this book uh, of Sora Neal, Neal and he um, According to what Juan Tablada wrote in the newspapers, he said that Miguel Covarrubias was the man who had discovered black people in the United States, bringing them to the most important uh, magazines and newspapers and looking at them. And this is the Harlem Renaissance and he's doing a visual representation with an introduction by Franz Boas here in this book, but he publishes continuously and represents New York in its totality. New York with all its faces. Uh, in the left side, we have a, a caricature of his that was done by Marius de Sayas. He did the cover of Vanity Fair during a lot of time. Here we have uh, the 1927, 1933, Vogue, the same. He also worked on stage, theatrical stages, sets for theater with Josephine Baker, with Rosa Rolando, who became later his wife, not much later, by the way. He was very close friend of Tina Modotti, of Edward Weston, and his illustrations became very famous. This is his Mexico, um, the pleasant art of caricature. In Vanity Fair, he did some impossible interviews that you can uh, see, if not online, directly in the Library of Congress. You can go and look at the impossible interviews he wrote and illustrated for Vanity Fair during years here. We see one from 1929, but also still in the 30s. Um, Jose Juan Tablada talks also about another Mexican who came to New York and who also did figures, an artist with words, invented a thing that he called calogramas. He was kind of a wild man, but he was represented in a gallery in the fifth, in the, and had exhibitions in Fifth Avenue also. It was a passing by star. Ah, this is a case. Let's see. Here's the story. This is a New Yorker cover that was repeated in 2018 by a relatively unknown Mexican artist, Matias Antoyo they decided to reprint it. It represents the traffic jams on Park Avenue, goes well with the honking. So we had him here, two of his car car caricatures, and we have his little cover. And then we have, let's move a little bit. We're going to go to jump into another poet. We are going to go to the book Poeta in Nueva York of Garcia Lorca, who, when translated, had such an enormous impact in poetry in English too. He came to New York only for a year. In theory, he came to learn English with a fellowship. He was heartbroken. He had had problems with a lover. He was depressed. He came to New York to uh, be in better shape and alas when he's here he writes these incredible poems I brought one in both oh, oh, oh. I made a little mistake I didn't bring it in English I don't know what I oh, know it is here only in English from the poem city without sleep life is not a dream look we fall down the stairs to eat damp earth, or we ascend to the edge of snow with a chorus of dead dahlias. 
and there's no forgetting, no sleep. Living flesh, kisses bind the lips in a tangle of recent pains, and those who suffer, suffer without rest, and those who fear death will carry it on their shoulders. Now we have another poet. I'm just doing this collection of poets and writers and artists for you, these scattered stories, these pieces of a whole story that one day we have to tell chronologically and following the changes in the city and understanding why they come from the different countries. The case of Mexico was so obvious, I said it, from the Mexican Revolution and the changes there. In the case of Puerto Rico, well, in the case of Santo Domingo, in the case of every one of the cities and the magnet or the possibility of living in the beach. In the case of Gilberto, when I brought him, though he's not a major figure, he's a very interesting writer, but he's a writer that is not like Garcia Lorca had that influence and that impact, but I brought him because he was taken by a, a, a Mexican-American a writer, Valeria Luiselli, who is a star in the New Yorker world and who makes him part of a novel of hers, Faces in the Crowd, by Valeria Luiselli. A character of hers is translating Gilbert Owen and is lying to the editors, telling them that it's an unknown American artist because she knows that they won't be interested in a strange peculiar Mexican poet. So she lies in order to see him polished. Now let's go to Guernica. We are momentarily in Spain. We are seeing Guernica nowadays. Um, we are seeing this uh, city in the, in the Basque region of Spain. And we are seeing uh, uh, um, a sculpture of Henry Moore done for Guernica to honor what happened in 1937 in Guernica, what happened with it when the Franco troops bombed the civilians, of which Picasso painted the art piece that is known as Guernica that lived in New York City during decades and decades because Picasso said he didn't want the piece to return to New York if it was um, under that regime, if it was under the assassin uh, government still. So we have here the Picasso Guernica who was for 42 years alone in the MoMA and that left to find its last house, Madrid, um, after that long stay. So he painted this when Guernica was bombed in 1937. By the way, when he started painting it, he didn't think he was going to do that piece. He was painting something for an international fair in Paris, art fair, he had been commissioned to paint it and he was thinking what forms am I going to do when this happened and he couldn't get it out of his heart and mind and went into it. But there's another Guernica that also was housed in New York for even more years. This other Guernica was painted by another Spanish artist, Luis Quintanilla. He was very well known then in New York. He had had an important exhibition in 1934. Uh, Ernest Hemingway had spoken about him. His paintings of war had been exhibited at the MoMA. He was really considered a hero. Well, he was commissioned to paint for the Art Fair of New York City, a painting, but in between the government of 
Spain was overtaken by this coup that Franco did, by, by the Guerra Civil de España, the Civil War in Spain, and the paintings that had already been finished were going to be at the World's Fair, but they did not arrive. The World's Fair of 19... Not, this is the second time they did the World Fair, but with the first one we had the stamp for 39. Spain had no pavilion, and the frescoes of Quintanilla were then abandoned in Bleecker Street, then sent to the Rockaways, there abandoned, and they were in very bad shape. Some of them had graffitis, till they were recovered, till very recently. Here we have, they were hidden. They were never shown to the New Yorker eyes. They were painted for New York, but the moment they had no more a backup to be exhibited and to be shown, they were just dumped and forgotten till they were recovered. Um, let me do a little pause to see how's our timing. Lisa, how is our timing? It is just after eight, so if you want to take maybe 10 or so more minutes and then we can move to questions. Okay, so let me just run a little bit. I'm going to skip the, this is Siqueiros. You, if you go to see the exhibition at the Whitney that you should go see, you're going to see how he influenced Pollock uh, they do not show the specific dripping influence of in Pollock that he learned from the workshop. And we have here, just for a second, a painting that Frida Kahlo did while she was in New York. She did not have any exhibition in New York alone for herself in her lifetime. The only Mexican artist that had it in those decades woman artist, I mean, is Maria Izquierdo. I'm going to show you now a painting of hers. But uh, what Frida Kahlo did those years, those at uh, the time that she lived in New York, uh, accompanying uh, Diego Rivera, the famous one was Diego Rivera. They always talked to, of her as the wife. She was an artist on her own, uh, with her own powers on her, but they didn't pay attention on her. She went a lot to the movies and that influenced her. The city and the movies influenced her to do this extraordinary painting. Um, and also she painted the suicide of Dorothy Hale. Here we have Maria Izquierdo, who lived in New York City, who exhibited in New York City and who unluckily has been had been forgotten during decades, but now there's about to open an exhibition of hers, unless it's been canceled, I hope not, but there was going to open an exhibition of, her, of hers at Los Angeles. So we, I hope it is the case and it travels and we are again able to see what she did with the city. What did she leave in New York City in such a different way? A city can be seen in so many ways. A city doesn't have only one inertia and can nourish, and an artist also can nourish a city in many different ways. Frida Kahlo, that has had all this influence. Well, you, I am going to skip this and we're going to go, I think, into the questions if you agree or we have time to read one more poem, but I'm going to skip the muralists because you have them now at the Whitney and I encourage you, if you haven't gone, which I hope it's going, is the case that you have already been there, um, I'm going to skip that story because it's thoroughly told in the exhibition. Here we have another Nobel Prize winner. By now we had um, Juan Ramón Jiménez, whom I mentioned. This is the second one I wanted to mention, that is Octavio Paz. It's mentioned at the beginning, but he, he passed in New York. He said that living in the USA for this short period of his life was for him enivrating physically and intellectually, that it gave him so much fresh air that living here during the time of the war was for him so, uh, uh, gave him life tonificante. 
I threw aside politics and its debates, and I submerged myself in poetry. Um, he said, Juan Ramón Huitoc. Um, this movie of Jorge Negrete that was shot in Mexico, it's a Mexican production, has a song of Octavio Paz. And I encourage you to one day or other just go to YouTube or see where you can see these movies of the golden age of cinema of Mexico that portrayed something very peculiar and where some of them produced, this one is the case, El Rebelde, it was produced by the same producer who produced the Buñuel's films. Buñuel was living in Mexico, went to exile from the Spanish Civil War in Mexico. Here we have uh, Paz and Elena Garro when they had just left New York and had arrived to Paris. And in the right side, they are back in Paris where they came to stay here. Sometimes Elena Garro, whom we see here in the right photograph also, in sitting in front of Bioy Casares, the Argentinian writer, came to New York because she wanted to, came without uh, Octavio, and this is also always uh, arriving already in the 50s, came to New York because she wanted to sell his her novel to a film producer and to an editor. She wanted, she, she trusted so much her novel that she thought it could be a movie and a bestseller. She couldn't do it. It's the first magical realism novel. We are going to see her here dancing a twist with Gabriel García Márquez, the author of The Hundred Years of Solitude, who not only danced with her this twist, but also danced with her novel. Her novel was a major influence for Gabriel García Márquez. And here she tried, but she, alas, failed. Garcia Marquez could make it, could make his novel an international bestseller, but Elena Garro wasn't that lucky to do it. Uh, when Octavio Paz uh, lived abroad, he insisted on translating uh, poets of the Spanish uh, world, of the Spanish speaking world. One of them is a, a poet correspondent to the Mexican muralists that you, I hope, will see in the Whitney Museum. And I encourage you to look at it. We won't have time here, I think, to read it all with care. But it's been translated by Samuel Beckett, one of his poems, and, and by, by Margaret Payer Sanders, his major poem that has to do with the Mexican Revolution and with the changes that we see in the muralists that are now, these days, exhibited at the Whitney Museum. I'm going to skip that. Julia de Burgos, who lived here in New York, arrived in 1940, uh, died in the streets, like uh, unrecognized, was, um, it had a, a kind of tragic end that has been very much debated recently. The version that we knew, the family says, is not true, but we don't know what in reality happened to her, how on earth she ended her life like a homeless, drinking too much and wandering in the streets of New York, which had been the major poet of Puerto Rico. Uh, here we have one of her poems, so luckily I think also I, we won't have time. And this is another artist who lived in, Me in New York and who influenced also New Yorker and other artists that had come to live in New York with his own tradition. He's a very peculiar artist, uh, Rufino Tamayo, because he nourishes himself with his the, the traditional art of Oaxaca, of his, of the region where he was born. Um, here we have this beautiful two women playing with the moon. Here, who paint, he painted it in New York. It was bought by New York Money. It's in the USA, as all these pieces I'm showing to you. They, none of them, 
live in Mexico. They live either in New York or in DC or in museums around this country. These are the pieces he did while he was living in New York City. And this is, in fact, New York as seen by him. It's so different from the Garcia Torres New York. It is so different, in fact, from the Pollock vibrancy. It is so different from the rest of the artists that were around and, in fact, at the same time, is so New Yorker. We see and we feel New York on it. Uh, our last um, writer I want to bring, I still have some others, but I think we don't have much time left, but the last one I do want to bring here is the third Nobel Prize winner that also had a relationship with New York. The relationship of uh, Juan Ramón Jiménez was in a way casual. He came here for personal reasons. The relationship of um, Octavio Paz was in many ways professional. He came here as a diplomat. He came here because he was a professor at Vermont during some time. He repeatedly came to New York. He was in New York when his Nobel Prize was announced. He had a connection with New York. He had a relationship with American poets and he had translated many of them in the case of Octavio Paz. Uh, he also um, wanted to belong to the New Yorker art world. He, when he lived in New York, he went almost daily to the MoMA and to the Metropolitan. He wanted to see all the wealth of art of the city, and he did, he deeply did, and wrote about it. Um, and in this third case, Gabriela Mistral, the Nobel Prize winner, lived with her couple, Dana, uh, during years in New York City, she was a professor at Barnard and was translated, as you can see here, already when she was gone, by Ursula K. Le Guin, beautifully translated. Octavio Paz did write several poems about New York, uh, Juan Ramón Jiménez, a whole book about New York, and other poems about New York, as many other poets, either exiles from their own countries or that have lived in New York City for different reasons and that have written and had dialogue with the other um, uh, poets that lived or have lived or have done their work in New York. Uh, Rubén Darío wrote a poem about Whitman Juan Ramón Jiménez wrote a poem about Whitman. Uh, García Lorca also wrote a poem about and with Whitman. And the case of Gabriela Mistral is pretty different because she was always in her poetry talking about Latin America. So I only brought for you, when you share this uh, PDF, you are going to have here one poem of hers that I thought could be in a way possibly talking about New York. In none of her poems, she really addresses the New York uh, um, theme directly. Okay, let's go then to our questions and answers. I stop the share. Thank you so, so much. Um, so there's so many things to think about. Um, we had an anonymous question come in that I'll ask, um, and it was, uh, why would Spanish-speaking artists like Diego Rivera focus on abstract art? Well, Diego Rivera, as you will see when you go to the Whitney Museum, stopped focusing about abstract art, and he even considered that period of his life a kind of dizziness or sickness, he even used that word. He mm -hmm. said he no longer, he thought it had been a disease in his life, and he became very explicit about her themes. He tells again a new version of the history of Mexico. He reinterprets the characters of Mexico and the world in his paintings. He went into something 
very explicit, very narrative, and very political. In his Parisian years that I brought here because I am counting on you all going to see the Whitney <laughs> exhibition, I didn't want to bring the same, but something out of that uh, um, narrative of that story that is very interesting. Um, but he then went only into something very explicit. In the case of Tamayo, that's the last uh, Mexican artist we saw here, what we see is he carries the tradition of his people, his very Indian region of Mexico, Zapotecan and all the other Indian nations that are in, in Oaxaca, and he reads that traditional art and puts it in dialogue with contemporary art. What he does is pretty wonderful. Um, in, in the sense that he recovers the oldest tradition and does the newest art at the same time. So I don't think they are all into abstraction. I think they have very strong personalities. In the case of Siqueiros that you will see in the Whitney Museum, the dripping master, to call it that way, he was all the time exploring new forms. Uh, and exploring them to try to address the contemporary political problems as they saw, as he saw them. Not that I'm a fan of his political ideas. He himself tried to assassinate Trotsky. He was a Stalinist, but it's not the it's not the judgment uh, I can now do of his art. During many years, I saw uh, Siqueiros, and I just closed my eyes. I had a a political divorce with him, I couldn't stand him. But in this, uh, in this, uh, in the case of uh, of his, I, I'm now able to appreciate what he is doing and also think what it politically means. That kind of disconnection of reality, how different he is from Diego, how different he is, in fact, even more from Orozco. Orozco is also very narrative is very explicit in his political addresses, and he is an, a terrific artist, a first-class artist that is so uh, rethinking what we as humans are made of. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Carlos. So Carlos, I have given you uh, permission to talk. You should be able to speak to us. Um. Hi, hi, Professor Boyosa. Um, Hello, Carlos. Um, so, I just have so some a quick question or just a general curiosity. So, some academics have theorized that Vasconcelos was actually a, a Nazi sympathizer and, in fact, very racist. According, like the whole thing, I, like I always looked up to La Raza Cosmica, but then it turns out that La Raza Cosmica is actually a, a sort of like a eugenics type of. Um, portrayal or writing. So do you think that that could have been like why Vasconcelos had such a controversial position that discouraged him from like really um, taking a like of New York or, or, you know, being fond of New York? I think that the reason why he didn't come to New York in 1940 doesn't have to do with his political uh, problems. I think it more has to do with the, but I'm not totally sure because I only know what he talked and what he wrote with Enrique Sureña. And I don't think that it was, it had to do with that. He had in fact lived here many years and he had promoted his artists in New York thoroughly. He had helped them to exhibit here and he had wanted them to have a visibility, understanding the power and the strength of the city. Uh, I think it more has to do possibly with the different kind of city life that New York offered to a Latino writer. 
Enrique Sureña uh, ended living in Buenos Aires after having taught many years in, I think it was Minneapolis. I don't know exactly, who, don't remember in this in second, exactly in which American universities he taught. Um, but they wanted more a kind of Latino city, I think. But I don't know for sure. What I do know for sure is that Pedro Enrique Sureña was no Nazi at all nor precisely Vasconcelos. Vasconcelos is problematic. It's very problematic in many ways, and it's incredibly valuable in other ways, as happens with personalities that are too active in public life. He's very controversial. He was never a Stalinist. He was a pro the 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 welfare of the most of the people around uh, he was not favoring the happy one percent that are millionaires he was not favoring whites he was favoring an idea of mestizos of a race that were all the races together and yes there are many things that are quite problematic but his book El Ulises Criollo uh, that I recommend you strongly to read and I think it's also translated into English is uh, is not something that you think he didn't want to come to New York because there was uh, a, a democratic and not a fascist uh, government because then in those days Mr. Trump was no president. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's a name one must never say unless one's, one, one wants to embitter oneself. Could you say a little more about um, Corrubia's relationship with Langston Hughes? Uh, they were close friends. Uh, Covarrubias, um, the Harlem Renaissance was there and he adored the authors, the music, the artists. Uh, and I, and he sympathized with Langston, Langston Hughes in many ways, not only the poetry that I think he made it be translated, but also the whole Harlem and the whole Black Matter of those times issues. Uh, so they were friends. And I think friendship, to really have a friend, you have to have a space of dialogue and a space of understanding. Um, and that, that was it. Thank you so much. Um, we have two remaining questions. And I think that I'm actually going to flip the order in which they came in, because I like one to, to close this out really well. Um, so Devora, could you ask your question? Yeah, you explained how the the Spanish speaking artists were were influenced um, by American art and you discussed what they brought to America. But how did how did American art how did American artists accept accept these forms and styles of painting? Did they did it influence them in any way? Uh, Deborah, thank you very much for your question, which also helps me correct my what I said, because I think that mainly those that I named here came to contribute, not came to be influenced, but they all came already. It's it's the kind of artist and writer I chose today to bring here. The ones that did, some of them have a transformation with the encounter of the city. Let's think of just Garcia Lorca that came from, from, from not that big city, not, not an industrial area world, not, not a car driven city, not the speed of New York, but came from a totally different environment that we saw a bit in his paintings. And for him, the city was kind of shocking. If one reads him, it's shocking, but it, he captured the feeling of the city too. The same Ruben Darío captured the feeling of the city. 
But I think none of the ones I brought, nor evidently the Sayas, nor evidently Covarrubias, none of them were raised here. This is the first half of the 20th century. If one is going to talk about Latino writers and artists in the second half, the story would be different, not to speak of today, because then they can be, they can grow here. But the ones I mentioned, they arrived here when they already had uh, an artistic persona. Even the Sayas that arrived so young had started publishing his car, car, caricatures in 1906. And as he was in this family, intellectually so wealthy, he already came with a whole, and he became a magnet to bring international artists and to feed the, the gallery of Stiglitz and to feel the capital of the art of the city. So none of them in reality, I think, came to learn or to be trained here, but they all came with their own and genes to say so, and their own impact and personality. Though many of them, and several of them in a very noticeable way, were not understood by the city, as is the case of Julia de Burgos. Julia de Burgos, who arrived to New York with, yes, there were political problems. She also had personal problems. Who doesn't have personal problems? She arrived to New York and a, she withered in the city. She couldn't go any place. When she arrived, the, 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 the community did, the New Yorican or pre-New Yorican community did, she gave a couple of readings and then she went nowhere. There was no space. There was no space to play for her, which was also the case of Owen that Valeria Luiselli took in her, to her, to her novel. And this case of the case of many others, no space to play. Uh, in the case of the artists I mentioned today, except the case of Luis Quintanilla, the Guernica number no. two, they were their art was bought here, so at least they took their pockets full. Uh, but and, and and money also they knew was a fuel to project more their art. But in the case of writers in a country where today 3% of the published books are the books in translation, I think now maybe a bit more, but normally it was 3%, or I don't know in which are we, I don't know if we arrived to 4%. So self-centered and so monolingual, for the writers this is a tough thing, a tough space to be. There's not this reciprocity to say it that way. I think that way I can answer your question and also I can kind of tune uh, what I tried to say about the artist. Was I clear? I think so, thank you. Um, and we have one final question um, and that's from Idris and please tell me if I mispronounced your name um, and you should be able to speak. Oh, no, you pronounced it fine. Thank you. Um, and by the way, uh, this was an amazing presentation. Um, I actually learned a lot about Latin American art that I've never learned about in any of my previous classes or throughout my whole like school life, whatever. Um, and I have a question. Um, so I know how uh, the art you talked about, it focused on modernism, muralism. You even have like contemporary and abstract art. Um, those types of themes. And what type of art do you think is present today in um, Latin American art? And where do you see it going in the future? Oh, I love your question. But I think I am really unable to answer it in a totality. Because Latin America is so big. And there are so many first class different artists. So it is pretty exciting to suddenly arrive at Buenos Aires and then do a little tour in their important galleries, enter the Malva, their Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, 
and not all there are travels. Or here, whenever I see there's the exhibition of a Latin American, Ibero-American and Caribbean artist, I go and see. There are many currents and um, I, I can't say, also because I do have a problem as a poet. There are some poets and writers that have their eyes like all the time looking at the present and the future. I don't know why, but my eyes are turned backwards. I'm all the time looking what happened before. Uh, so I kind of stumble in the present and future. I, but I can tell you, I do know how it was in the 80s of the last century. I know how it was in the 90s. I think I know how it was in the 20s. But how it is today, my eyes don't focus properly. I do devour what I can and what I see. I love art. But there are so many currents and so many things happening. It's so strange because the world has shrunk with the web and with the transportation. Well, it had shrunk till now we are living in another, but also it's shrunk in some land, let's call it now. It has been become more contact with itself, with the most remote spaces. But art has like kind of gone wilder, further one from the other one. So I do see I adore some artists that are pretty, like I would say, realistic. And then others that don't even believe that you can paint and they are, don't want to do objects, but they are doing other things or audible things or tactile things or th it's, it's so wide. I can't answer the question, but I'll try to study and maybe in 10 years, I can tell you in the list. And well, with that, I want to thank you so, so much for this really enchanting evening and sharing your knowledge with us. And I'm so sorry that you can't hear what I'm sure is a wild round of applause coming from our participants. And I want to wish everybody a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Good night.